This is the sixth and final lecture in the series, A Theory of Productive Activity, Profit, and Saving. Thank you very much, and good morning once again. Uh, along with many of you, uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Peacock's lectures in integration. Unfortunately, I, can't, I was not able to hear them all, or all of them, the ones I heard in full. And I've been trying to apply uh, what he's been saying to what I'm doing. And uh, I'm glad to learn that uh, what I've been doing all these years is reduction and integration. <laughs> Only I haven't known it. Uh, and so one of the things I'd like to do this morning is uh, partly uh, make a kind of epistemological commentary on my own theoretical presentation in the light of the philosophical framework that he's developed. Now, I want to say at the very outset that uh, nothing I say, and certainly above all anything to do with epistemology, should be taken as uh, necessarily representing his views or implying any endorsement uh, of his, still less that of Ayn Rand or even TJS. Uh, my opinions are not necessarily always those of the top management of TJS. <laughs> All right, let me say that uh, up to a certain point, I've uh, provided reduction in connection with the net consumption formula. Uh, it isn't quite at the perceptual level, but if you pay attention to it, I think it follows inescapably uh, from the laws of arithmetic and uh, some very elementary principles of accounting. If you think about the meaning of the terms, you cannot escape the conclusion that uh, sales revenues exceed productive expenditure uh, by a, a source of consumption and that source is uh, the consumption of the owners and creditors of business. If you just focus on uh, the material presented and you put in the effort, uh, you can grasp that as unquestionably true. Now, a problem arises. I think there are people who put in that uh, amount of effort. They do see the truth, but the problem is, well, so what? Because it sounds like uh, it's coming from Canarsie a little bit and going to Canarsie. Well, uh, let me point out that already, uh, on the basis of that proposition, we've had a number of instances of integration. Uh, the integration has not been necessary to confirm the truth of the proposition, but the integrations have indicated some wider implications of the proposition. For example, once you accepted the idea that the total profit in the economy uh, is raised by a rise in net consumption. The question arose in some people's minds, well, does this mean that an individual capitalist can raise his profits by stepping up his own consumption? And it was necessary to deal with that question. And dealing with it represented an integration, because we showed that an individual capitalist wouldn't raise his profits. He'd operate to raise profits of other capitalists. and in fact, uh, those capitalists with the lowest rates of net consumption tend to accumulate capital. Those with above average rates decumulate capital. There are implications here for the whole subject of economic inequality. If we had a little more time, we could show that there is a tendency for uh, relative wealth and income in a capitalist society to gravitate according to two principles. It goes to those businessmen and capitalists on the one side with the lowest rates of net consumption, and on the other side with the greatest uh, degree of innovation and improvement. They earn the highest rates of profit, and they're saving and investing the most out of them. Uh, we came up against a couple of other integrations. Uh, one of the members of the audience, Mrs. Lienemann, raised the question, well, uh, this appears to contradict the doctrine of opportunity cost. And so it did and an integration required overthrowing the doctrine of opportunity cost, and along with it, the doctrine of imputed income. 
uh, a further implication was if there was nothing but net consumption, zero productive expenditure, all income is profit. Well, an integration of that, of wider application, is overthrowing the whole framework of uh, Smith and Marx for the exploitation theory. Now, still, I'm sure there's a lot of floating going on, but I'm just indicating uh, that the process I am following uh, is a grounding in uh, things that are elementary, simple arithmetic, the very simple elementary business accounting principle, you're spending money for the sake of making money, your profit is the difference between what you pay out and what you take in, and we derived an explanation for that difference. Now I want to do some further reduction. And I recognize there's a problem here in the reduction because where I'm reducing to, uh, regrettably, is at a level that most of you cannot take for granted, although uh, properly people should. It's just our educational system doesn't go into this. I'm going to make a reduction to uh, elementary principles of business accounting. Now, I know in my own experience you can get a PhD in economics and not know how to read a balance sheet or an income statement. Uh, I believe that every uh, semi-educated person in a modern society should know this. If you want to buy a share of stock or even own a bank deposit, you should know how to read a balance sheet and an income statement. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, going over a balance sheet and income statement, and this will be the basis for laying a further foundation for the theory of profit and propounding. And hopefully, when, by the time we finish, we'll find there are some anomalies raised that will need reconciliation. And that, will re that requires further integration. And the integration there, which I'll just be able to indicate, is an entirely different way of viewing the significance of saving and the causes of capital accumulation. Well, if you'll be good enough to turn to page 12 of the uh, outline summary, I, call, I label this figure two, hypothetical sum of all business balance sheets, year one in billions. Now, the layout of this balance sheet could be applied to any individual company. It's a very stripped down, basic type of balance sheet. We're ignoring credit and debt. We're looking uh, simply at physical assets. On the left, we have assets. On the right, liabilities. And as our first asset, we have cash. And that uh, requires no further reduction. That's this stuff. And checking deposits. We know what cash is. Now we have an item, inventories and work in progress. Well, uh, in a retail store, the inventories are the goods they've got uh, in the shops. In a manufacturing establishment, it's the supplies, the uh, a warehouse full of tires for an auto company, uh, piles of steel sheet, etc. And we also have work in progress. That represents uh, the goods that are partly, way, partly the way along. Uh, in an auto plant, it would be automobile chassis uh, not yet completed. Uh, all the different automobiles at different stages of manufacture. And of course, the finished uh, automobiles sitting in the lots of the auto plants. All right, now I've given a monetary figure uh, alongside of inventories and work in progress. Where do we get this? Well, this figure simply represents the sums of money that have been spent to buy the materials and supplies that are still on hand. And also, in the case of uh, manufacturing establishments or any type of processing going on, uh, the value of inventories, finished inventories, and work in progress uh, reflects the payment of wages along the way to process the materials. So, this figure of 3,000 uh, as the value of inventories, this reflects purchases of materials, uh, goods at wholesale, supplies, and to a substantial degree, the payment of wages. That's where the inventory figure comes from. Uh, now we have a further figure, gross plant and equipment. And that would include any office buildings, any kind of commercial property. 
What does this represent? Well, this represents simply the outlays of money previously required to obtain these assets. Uh, you might, if you buy machinery, suppose a company buys a machine for a million dollars, well, that million dollars would be part of its gross plant and equipment. Uh, if money is spent to construct its factory, the money spent to construct the factory is part of the gross plant and equipment. And this heading can also include wage payments. Imagine we had a company acting as its own contractor, so what it would buy is construction materials and pay the wages of construction workers, and that would enter into the heading uh, gross plant and equipment. Then we have the item less accumulated depreciation reserve. Well, when you buy plant and equipment, uh, it has a limited life, and each year some portion of its useful life is used up. Uh, the most common procedure is to figure out how long will the thing last and then to subtract uh, a, a, an, equ an equivalent percentage. So if we spent a million dollars for a machine that would last 10 years, in each of 10 years under the most common depreciation method, we would set aside $100,000 as depreciation. At the end of 10 years, such a machine would have had built up against it an accumulated depreciation reserve of a million dollars. Well, what we're doing in this balance sheet, we're looking at the balance sheet of all business firms in the entire economic system. At any moment, between all of them taken together, they hold a certain quantity of cash. They have inventories and work in progress that total up to a certain value. And they have gross plant of a certain value and accumulated depreciation reserves. And the difference between the accumulated depreciation and the gross plant, that's the net plant if we add up the net plant and equipment, the inventories and the cash, we have the total assets. Then over on the liability side, since we're not looking at debt, well, the assets are owned by the stockholders and the bondholders have claims to it. The liability side represents uh, what is due by the business enterprises to the stockholders and bondholders. That's the the capital. All right. Now this is a rudimentary uh, balance sheet. We're taking, the, but it's the balance sheets of the entire economic system. Now I, I'll spend a couple of minutes going over a hypothetical sum of all business income statements in Figure Three. And when I've done that, we're going to derive the uh, sum of all business income statements from activities going on in the sum of all balance sheets. Well, we've got sales revenues. I'm assuming 12,000 billion, 12 trillion dollars is the total sales revenues of all businesses in the economic system. Then we have to subtract various categories of costs to arrive at profit. Now, costs are broken down here according to a somewhat different system of classification than wages and capital goods. We have uh, selling general and administrative expenses as our first item. And this is the kind of item you'd find in a typical business income statement. What does this represent? Well, this represents the wages and salaries of the clerical workers, the executives, salesmen's commissions, their salaries, advertising expenses, uh, the payment of lighting and heating bills, uh, the rent on facilities, this would be the common sort of things that would enter into selling general and administrative expenses. Then we have cost of goods sold. Now this is a slightly tricky concept. Uh, cost of goods sold literally means the cost of the goods that are sold. The cost is rung up when the good is sold. Let me give you this example. Uh, in December, General Motors spends $100 million for steel sheet, which is used to produce automobiles that will not be ready for sale until January. It's going to be work in process. In January, General Motors will sell the automobiles uh, that contain $100 million worth of steel sheet purchased in December. All right, General Motors has to prepare an income statement at the close of December, as of December 31st. The 100 million that they've spent for steel sheet in December 
will not show up in the income statement of that year. Let's say it's 1986. The 100 million spent for steel sheet in December of 86 will not show up as one of the costs deducted from sales revenues in 86. Why? Well, that money is in inventory. That's part of uh, work in progress or inventory. When will this expenditure of $100 million show up in General Motors' income statement? When those automobiles are sold. When it's the cost of the automobiles sold. So if those automobiles are sold in the next year, they'll figure into the income statement of the next year. Now, it's very similar with depreciation. When a firm buys a machine or constructs a plant, the outlay for the machine or the plant is not a cost deducted from sales revenue in the current accounting period. It will show up as costs over a future period, bit by bit, as depreciation. So there is a connection, yet a difference, between what I've been calling productive expenditure and costs. I pointed out several times, we'll take productive expenditure and costs as synonymous for purposes of simplification. They're related, but they're really not the same. There is a timing difference. Today's costs, to a substantial degree, reflect productive expenditures of the past. Today's productive expenditures, to a substantial degree, will show up as costs in the future. All right, well, that having been said, we're now in a position to drop the assumption that productive expenditure and costs are the same. We can see that productive expenditure and cost in any given accounting period can be unequal. And we'll have to uh, restate our formula for what total profits equal. Profits will equal uh, something more than just net consumption. Now what I've got here, I want to integrate this uh, sum of all income statements in figure 3 with the uh, sum of all balance sheets in figure 2. <clears throat> We've got a thousand of cash in the sum of all balance sheets. What does business do with this cash? <clears throat> well, it uses it to make productive expenditures and to finance the consumption expenditures of its owners and creditors. So let us assume that each month the thousand of cash is drawn down in making productive expenditures in paying dividends uh, out of which there's consumption and, and uh, uh, providing other sources of consumption. So each month business is putting into the system a thousand and each month business receives a thousand. Whatever business spends for any form of capital goods in the same period business receives. We're still assuming that wages have a counterpart in consumption, and there's consumption of, uh, out of dividends, interest, and draw. So each month business is spending 1,000. Each month business is taking that 1,000 right back in. Well, that's where we get 12,000 of sales revenues in the sum of income statements. Business considered as a whole, and this is a very important point in its own right, business, the productive process, generates its own monetary demand. Business is the source of the demand for the products of business. And as we've already uh, substantially seen, the normal activities of the business system make it possible for the average business to sell its products at a financial profit. In the nature of the case, business is putting more funds into the market to buy its product than will show up as its costs. Sales revenues exceed productive expenditure. Well, here's a, a, an important significant implication of this. The business system is self-sustaining. You could call this Say's Law too. Those of you who uh, were here last time or who heard my tapes, Say's Law says that production creates purchasing power. Well, the same basic underlying idea, the productive process provides the money to buy the product and to buy it at a profit. Business is not dependent on an outside class of consumers. It's not dependent on the government. It itself, in its own normal operations, is injecting funds sufficient to buy the product of the average enterprise at a profit. Net consumption is one such basis. Now we're about to see another. 
I'm deliberately now setting things up where uh, productive expenditure is going to exceed costs. We've got a thousand of cash. Let us imagine that the costs which business incurs each month will be 900. Each month there's going to be 950 of productive spending and 50 of net consumption. Now, if we have 900 of costs each month, if we multiply by 12, the answer will be tw uh, 10,800. That's our total cost figure in the income statement. We're assuming there's 900 of costs each month. And we're also assuming now there's 950 of productive expenditure and only 50 of net consumption, 50 of consumption by the owners and creditors of business. And what I want to try to show you now is that to whatever extent productive spending exceeds costs, there is going to be net investment. There is going to be an increase in the assets of business precisely equal to any excess of productive spending over costs. Now, <clears throat> let's see <clears throat> just how and why this occurs. I've told you <clears throat> uh, productive expenditure, when it takes place to buy machinery or equipment or any such durable asset, the cost shows up as depreciation. When a business constructs a factory, if you put up $10 million this year to build your factory, you don't say, well, this year I have $10 million of cost. No, your cost on account of the factory this year is the depreciation. That factory may last 50 years. Your cost would be 2% of the $10 million for each of 50 years. Well, the productive spending that takes place on account of plant and equipment should be viewed as added into the plant and equipment account. The depreciation cost that shows up in the income statement is being subtracted out. Let us take this example. We've got here in the income statement 1,200 of depreciation. And I'm, I'm going to assume, just for the sake of illustration, that in the same year, there's 1,300 of spending for plant and equipment. Businesses are spending $1,300 to buy new plant and equipment. The depreciation on all the existing plant and equipment that they have is $1,200. All right, let's look at this balance sheet. We have, we start out, we've got $10,000 of gross plant and equipment. This year, business spends $1,300 buying new plant and equipment. What will gross plant and equipment look like next year? And I can tell you what it looks like next year. We have figure four on page 14. But you could arrive at the figure. If we begin, we have 10,000 of gross plant and equipment. And we spend 1,300 for plant and equipment this year. What will our gross plant and equipment be next year? Yeah? 11,300. That will be our gross plant and equipment. Now, if we have 1,200 of depreciation going on this year, we began, we had 4,000 of accumulated depreciation. What will be accumulated depreciation next year? 5,200. And I show that in figure four. Well, now, if we're adding 1,300 to gross plant and 1,200 to the accumulated depreciation reserve, what's the effect on net plant? It goes up by 100. To the extent that our productive expenditure on account of plant and equipment exceeds depreciation cost, what's happened to the value of the net plant account? It's gone up. There's a simple arithmetical principle. The change is the difference between the sum of additions and the sum of subtractions. If we're adding 1,300 because we're buying new plant and equipment to that value and subtracting 1,200 because of depreciation, there's a net change of 100. We have net investment in plant and equipment to whatever extent productive spending for plant and equipment exceeds depreciation. And a perfectly analogous principle will apply to inventories. If in a given year businesses are spending uh, let us imagine 6,500 to buy and produce inventory, and they have cost of goods sold of 6,000, 
and we start out, our opening inventory is 3,000 in figure two. Now over the course of this coming year, 6,500 is paid out for the purpose of buying materials, goods at wholesale, paying wages to labor to process the materials. 6,500 is spent for that purpose. And cost of goods sold is 6,000. What's going to be the value of our closing inventory? What is 3,000 plus 6,500 minus 6,000? 3,500. To the extent that productive expenditure on account of inventory exceeds cost of goods sold, we have net investment in inventory. Now you might want a, a concretization or two of how we can do this. Suppose we're starting a business. Let's imagine you're stocking a store. And you are placing orders. We'll look at it at the level of an individual business. Here we've got it in billions. We can look at it in terms of thousands. In the course of a year, your particular store places orders uh, for $6,500 worth of merchandise. And merchandise comes into your store that has an acquisition value of $6,500. And in the course of the year, the merchandise that you sell had a previous acquisition value of $6,000. Well, what's happened to the value of the merchandise in your store? It's gone up by 500. Well, to the extent that productive expenditure exceeds costs, we have uh, net investment. And uh, over on page 15, I work out the same thing uh, algebraically. I explain the meaning of the terms. Productive expenditure can be broken down into three broad categories. B1 is Productive expenditure on account of plant and equipment. It's the spending to buy machinery, to construct buildings, to pay the wages of construction labor, the installers of machinery. B2 is productive expenditure on account of inventory or work in progress. It's the expenditure to buy materials, supplies, uh, pay the wages of workers to process that material. B3 is Productive expenditure, which is instantaneously expensed, which is treated instantaneously as a cost deducted from sales revenue. And that is essentially synonymous with selling general and administrative expense. What you pay the clerical workers, the lighting and heating bill, typically that would be written off instantaneously. The others are debited, added into asset accounts. And then the costs, total costs, the same costs we have in the income statement, I'm calling D, and D is equal one part to uh, depreciation cost, that's D1. B1 minus D1 is net investment in plant and equipment. D2 is cost of goods sold. B2 minus D2 is net investment in inventories and work in progress. B3 is the expense productive expenditure. D3 is the same thing in costs. When you subtract one from the other, it's zero. So, Productive expenditure minus costs is net investment, which equals net investment in plant plus net investment in inventories. Now, total profits in the economic system are always equal to the sum of net consumption plus net investment. And I summarize that in the few lines following. I give you an algebraic derivation. Profits are sales minus costs. And sales minus costs are equal to sales minus productive expenditure plus productive expenditure minus costs. Well, what is sales minus productive expenditure? Net consumption. What's productive expenditure minus costs? Net investment. So profits equal the sum of net consumption plus net investment. Now, there would be uh, a lot more that could be said uh, directly in connection with this. But uh, let's uh, make the following observation. I've said earlier, and we'll, we'll explain now, uh, that there is always a tendency for costs and productive expenditure to equalize. They are not one and the same, but they tend to be equal. And let us begin to see uh, why and under what conditions that is so. 
Imagine that we have an individual company which each year buys a machine for a million dollars and this machine will last 10 years. All right, in year one, it spends $1 million. What's its depreciation in year one? Yes? 100000 Now, in year two, it buys another such machine. What will be its total depreciation charged in year two? 200000 The 100000 on the new machine and the second 100000 on the old machine. Now, in year three, the total depreciation will be 300000 where will this stop? What will total depreciation be in year 10? One million. Because then there'll be 10 machines, each of which is being depreciated at one-tenth. Now notice, there's a principle contained in this example. If plant and equipment spending stays the same, and it's for assets of the same life, what happens to depreciation? annual depreciation. It will grow toward the plant and equipment spending. Depreciation, annual depreciation, tends to rise to equality with current spending for plant and equipment. And cost of goods sold tends to rise to equality with spending on account of inventory and work in progress. So there is a tendency for costs to rise toward productive spending. And we can reinforce uh, this tendency toward equality from the opposite side. So long as productive expenditure is ahead of cost, so long as productive spending is greater than cost, what's happening to the total sum of accumulated capitals in the economy expressed in money? They're growing. So long as net investment is going on, the total monetary value of the assets is increasing the total sum of capitals is going up. What is the likely effect of that on consumption? If people have more and more accumulated capital relative to their incomes, what is the likely effect on the extent to which they feel able to afford to consume out of their incomes? They'll consume more. Well, there will be a tendency for net consumption to be going up at the same time that costs are going up, and if net consumption is going up, what's happening to productive expenditure? That will be coming down. So there's a tendency, so long as net investment takes place, there's a tendency for, uh, product, for uh, net consumption to go up, productive expenditure to come down, and costs, meanwhile, are rising toward productive expenditure. There's a tendency for productive expenditure and costs to equalize. And when that happens, the uh, one remaining permanent determinant of the rate of profit would be the rate of net consumption. Now, this has uh, implications. Let us consider what it is that will perpetuate net investment. What it is that will prevent depreciation from ever catching plant and equipment spending or cost of goods sold from catching up with spending on account of inventory? And I'll give you an answer which may shock some of you, but that this will just raise a question for further integration. Let us assume now that from one year to the next, there is an increase in the quantity of money in the economic system. I'm going to pick a nice, convenient number to deal with a number much bigger than I would ever want to see the quantity of money increase. Let's assume that the quantity of money is growing 10% a year and that spending in the economy is growing 10% a year, including spending for plant and equipment. Now let's make a contrast. We saw before when we took the case of the 10-year machine that if you spent a million dollars for each of 10 years, in year 10 depreciation would equal a million. All right, let's take a shorter time so I don't have to spend as much uh, time with the arithmetic. We have year, we'll, we'll make it uh, just a four-year process, but the principle should be clear. Year one, two, three, four. We have uh, productive expenditure for plant and equipment, B1, following the terminology of the handout. In year one, B1 is 100. 
In year two, B1 is 110. In year three, B1 is 121. In year four, B1 is 13310. Now let's calculate what depreciation is going to be, which I've labeled D1. Well, in year one, it's 25. In year two, it's not going to be 50. It's going to be 25 plus, we're assuming a four-year asset now. <clears throat> to make the arithmetic simple, we're assuming the asset lasts just four years. Depreciation in year two is going to be 52.50. It's going to be a second 25 on this 100 plus one-fourth of this 110. In year three, the total uh, depreciation is going to be 82.75. It'll be the third 100 over here, the third 25 over here, the second 2750 over here, and uh, one fourth of 121. In year four, the total depreciation will be 116.25. Now notice, if there had been no increase in the quantity of money and growth in spending, what would have happened to the relation between depreciation and spending for plant and equipment. They would have equalized. But will they ever equalize so long as spending for plant and equipment has a growth factor and the average life of the asset stays the same? Can they ever equalize? There's a mathematical principle implied. The uh, depreciation in any given year is the sum of a series of fractions of past numbers, each of which was smaller. When we add up a series of fractions of a smaller series of numbers, it cannot be as great as the current number in the series. We've got PhDs in math in the audience who I'm sure could explain it in much better uh, language than I can, but I think the principle is clear. All right, now, I think this is a logical inference from what I've been saying, and it's an inference that goes back to uh, just looking at uh, balance sheets and income statements. Yet this might be unsettling. Now the implication is, there's, there's two possibly unsettling implications. Net investment in terms of money as a permanent continuing phenomenon is the result of the increase in the quantity of money. I think that follows logically. Now you might say, but are you telling me that capital accumulation is the result of the creation of money? Isn't this inflationism? It might sound like that. And also, we should also be able to see if it's the case that profits equal the sum of net consumption and net investment, and net investment uh, as a permanent continuing phenomenon depends on the increase in the quantity of money. Well, so then, to some extent, does the rate of profit. A part of the explanation of the rate of profit comes down to the rate of increase in the quantity of money. And you might say, well, isn't this just inflationism? And let me back up a bit and say, we can see a connection between the increase in the quantity of money and the rate of profit more directly. Just think, profit means you want to sell your goods for more than you've paid to produce them. Well, now, to the extent that the quantity of money is growing, over the time interval between when you paid out money for factors of production and when you sell the product, what's going to be the effect on the money that's out there to buy your product and the amount of money you can expect to sell your product for? The more the increase in the quantity of money between the period of time when you've made your productive expenditures and when you sell the product, the greater is going to be the money profit. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, okay, but I'm not concerned with money profit, I'm just concerned with real profit. Well enough. But let us keep in mind what is actually happening to the money profits. The, pardon me? Well, they may or they may not be. Now, you see, let us realize what is making part of the money profit is an increase in the quantity of money. This is not the only determinant. We have net consumption. There can be net investment without an increase in the quantity of money, but it won't be permanent. Net investment without an increase in the quantity of money always tends to disappear. The, the fact is 
the rate of increase in the quantity of money does add something to the rate of profit. And as at least a close approximation, I think we could establish that if the quantity of money and volume of spending in the economic system increases 2% a year, whatever the rate of profit otherwise would have been, it will now be 2% more, approximately. So if there were no increase in the quantity of money, and now we have uh, the rate of profit would have been 4%, and now there's a 2% annual increase in money and spending, I would say, at least as an approximation, the rate of profit will be 6% instead of 4%. Now, this does not mean that the profits are overstated. It would, you could be sure, if there were a radical increase. But let us suppose that at the same time that money and spending are going up 2% a year, physical production and supply are, gro are going up 2% a year. What will be happening to prices? Won't they be stable? Now, here we have 2% added on to the money rate of profit, but does this mean that this money rate of profit exceeds the real rate of profit? If we have 2% more money rate of profit, but prices are not rising, doesn't this profit represent extra purchasing power? It is extra purchasing power. Now, if the rate of increase in money is modest, so that it does not exceed the rate of increase in production, it is still money which is adding to the money rate of profit. And it's the increase in production which is adding to the real rate of profit. But what we have to recognize is, no matter what, a portion of the money rate of profit is determined by the increase in the quantity of money. To the extent that the increase in production is of the same order of magnitude, the extra money profit uh, is not an artificial profit, it's not an unreal profit. Where you get an overstated profit is if the rate of increase in money and spending surpasses the rate of increase in production and supply. Suppose we have a 2% increase in production and supply and money and spending are going up 10%. All right, then I'm saying, the increase in money and spending will tend to add 10 points to the money rate of profit. And what will happen to prices? Prices will tend to go up 8%. Here, we will have 10 points added on to the money rate of profit. And uh, most of this extra money profit will simply be offset by higher prices. And here, you could argue uh, the money profit is is overstated uh, in respect. It's not a, a real rate of profit. It's purely a money rate of profit. But still, what is it that's determining the money rate of profit? The growth in the quantity of money. Now, let's suppose we have a 2% annual increase in production and supply, no increase in the quantity of money. All we have determining the rate of profit is the rate of net consumption. We'll say that's 5%. And now we have a 2% annual increase in production and supply, no growth in money and spending. Prices will drop on the order of 2%. Well, now, if you're making a 5% money rate of profit, you began the year with 1,000, you finished the year with 1,050, and prices are 2% lower, what's happened to your real buying power? How much do you have in terms of buying power when you have 1,050 now where you used to have only 1,000, and prices are now 2% lower. Don't you have virtually a 7% rate of actual gain? Well, th the principle here is the rate of increase in production and supply adds to the real rate of profit. The rate of increase in money and spending adds to the nominal rate, the money rate. We should not think that the rate of increase in production and supply automatically adds to the real rate. Uh, to the money rate. We shouldn't think that the rate of increase in production and supply adds to the money rate. It adds to the real rate. What adds to the money rate? The growth in money. Now this has a connection with the remarks Professor Zenholtz was making about the fallacies uh, that people held in the American colonies. They're poor, they need more money. Well. Throughout the history of economics, there's always been a confusion between money and wealth. 
And the confusion is not simply that we confuse dollars and gold with wealth, but people are confusing the money value of goods with the goods. What makes the money value of the whole economic system go up is the growth in money. What makes the real wealth that we enjoy go up is the increase in production. And the two may or may not go together, or they may occur at very different rates of change. What's determining the money rate of profit, apart from net consumption, is basically the growth in the quantity of money. What determines the real rate of profit is, to a large degree, the rate of increase in production and supply. Now, let me point out uh, some further implications here. What is it that keeps saving in existence out of money income? Why is it that every year people save out of money income? What would happen if we didn't have any increase in the quantity of money? Prices would drop. People's accumulated savings would come to stand in a certain ratio to their current incomes. And at that point, they would consume the totality of their money incomes. Does this mean that the growth in wealth and production would be at an end? Suppose we weren't adding to the sum total of accumulated money capitals or accumulated savings in terms of money. Does that mean that the growth in real wealth and production would have to stop? No, it could go on. What form would it take? Yes? Not the barter system. There's still money. It's just money of a constant quantity and a constant volume of spending. What would, what would be the consequence of more production confronting the same volume of spending? Prices would fall. Every year, whatever existing savings people had would buy more. Every year, whatever money incomes they had would buy more. Now, this has very important implications for understanding just what is the role of saving in the accumulation of capital. Uh, normally, we tend to think that to have more capital year after year, we have to have more saving. That is true in our normal context of an increase in quantity of money. The fact that each year we need to have more saving is the accompaniment and necessitated by the increase in the quantity of money. If we didn't have an increase in quantity of money, saving out of money income would come to an end. And capital accumulation, the increase in wealth, would occur through falling prices. Now immediately I can answer a question, or uh, to at least to a degree, that uh, Mr. Jolivet raised uh, last week on the doctrine of the falling rate of profit. It's usually assumed that saving and capital accumulation bring about a falling rate of profit. Well, does the saving that we do out of our uh, rising money incomes in any way imply a falling rate of profit on the basis of what we've been discussing this morning? Can, can any of you see this? What is this saving part of a process of? Yes? It accompanies that investment which takes place on the foundation of a rise in the quantity of money. And what is the impact of this net investment on the rate of profit? It's higher. Well, the saving that's going on that we observe around us is not lowering the rate of profit. It's part of a wider process uh, which helps to make the money rate of profit higher than it would otherwise be. The saving that year in and year out goes on is the accompaniment of a rising quantity of money which adds something to the nominal rate of profit. It does not operate to make the rate of profit lower. It's part of a process of the rate of profit being higher. Now, if we did not have an increase in the quantity of money, then from one year to the next, we would not have saving out of money income. The uh, buying power of the existing accumulated savings would be greater. 
Here again, there would not be a tendency toward any falling rate of profit. The rate of profit would be lower than when we have a growing quantity of money, but it would not tend to fall. If, in this context, people wanted to save, if people wanted to save in the context of an economy with no growth in money, the effect would be to operate to make the increase in production accelerate. The system would become more capital intensive. We'd reach a new equilibrium where, once again, saving out of income tended to stop. We would have, I, I mentioned the other day, that uh, saving in such a context operates as force to acceleration. We don't need force to have motion. Force creates acceleration. Saving out of money income in an economy with a constant quantity of money will accelerate the rate of progress. All right, well, there is, in fact, uh, no tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Now, the connection between saving and capital accumulation, if you think of the implications of all of this, if we had no increase in the quantity of money and saving out of incomes comes to an end, does this mean that saving doesn't count for capital accumulation? Is that what's implied? Or does it mean, perhaps, that the connection is different than we thought it was? I would argue that when we grasp the fact that the implication of no growth in money is no further saving out of money income, we then see the relationship between saving and capital accumulation in a different light. The connection is the ratio of accumulated savings to consumption. What's important about saving is not the annual percentage we're making out of our income. That's not the fundamental. The fundamental thing is what will be the ratio of the accumulated savings to current consumption. And economic progress will, depend, will be the greater, the higher the ratio. Economic progress depends on gross saving, saving out of sales revenue. Not that this is beyond net income. Business firms have to save, business firms have to not engage in consumption, not support the consumption of their owners, use the money instead to buy capital goods and pay wages. There is where the significance of saving uh, really lies, and that becomes clear in an economy with a constant quantity of money. The significance of saving is it will help to determine what proportion of the output of the economic system will be capital goods, what proportion will be consumer goods. That's where the significance of saving lies. You can see the true significance of saving when you examine things in the context of no increase in the quantity of money. Then we realize there's no saving out of net income. Then we have to ask the question, well, what it, does saving have any significance or doesn't it? And then we will see that the significance lies, I, haven't, I don't claim to have demonstrated this to you, mind you, I'm just uh, indicating it. The significance of saving lies in the ratio of savings to consumption and in the ratio of spending for capital goods to spending for consumer goods. Then we see further things. What's going to uh, continue to bring about an increase in the supply of capital goods? Well, it's sufficiently high ratios, a sufficiently high degree of capital intensivity, a sufficiently high proportionate production of capital goods. But then there are other things. We come to see that one of the main sources of capital accumulation is technological progress. See, let us look at it this way. We get more capital goods initially through an act of saving. What are the capital goods used for? What do we use them for in production? Do we just produce consumer goods? We produce both consumer goods and capital goods. And saving is going to determine in what proportion we produce both. The higher the degree of saving in the economy, the greater will be our concentration on capital goods. All right, now, if we have more capital goods from any source, 
This will give us a greater ability to produce. But just more consumer goods? More capital goods too. Now, to get more capital goods, does this mean we have to further accelerate our concentration on saving? Can't we get more capital goods as a result of having gotten more capital goods, which we now use to step up our production? All right, well, what would we require so that every time we get more capital goods, we can achieve a proportionate increase in the production both of capital goods and consumer goods? Well, what will keep the productivity of these extra capital goods constant? What will stop the extra capital goods from running up against what economists call diminishing returns? Yes? I'm, I don't hear you. What will, will put them to use, but what's required so that when we put them to use, the output will increase in proportion to the extra capital goods and we won't have diminishing returns. Yes? Technological progress. Technological progress. Technological progress is the offset to diminishing returns. Well, technological progress is an essential element of capital accumulation going on. You see, for the first time, when we're able to see things without money uh, increasing, and without saving out of money and having the confusion that the rate of profit is dropping, now for the first time we can appreciate the real role of technological progress. Technological progress operates to increase the supply of capital goods. It's a major source of the supply of capital goods. Now just think for a moment. Imagine the Industrial Revolution had not occurred. What kind of capital accumulation could we have on the strength of any degree of saving by itself? Here we are, we have a, an economy of sailing vessels and horse-drawn wagons, and now people are going to save more heavily. We're going to have a little bit more, but we couldn't have very much more. Now their extra saving was very important, but in order for their extra saving to result in more, a bigger supply of capital goods, which in turn brought about a more, further supply of capital goods that brought about a further proportionate increase, what did we need to have? Technological progress. Now let me point out that this is directly opposite to what you'll read in uh, practically any uh, textbook of economics. The usual view is capital accumulation comes about from saving. And the extra saving is thought of as using up a scarce, precious stock of investment opportunities and lowering the rate of profit. And then we need technological progress to come along to provide additional investment opportunities and hopefully maintain the rate of profit. And there was a whole popular doctrine propounded by the teacher of Samuelson, uh, Alvin Hansen at Harvard back in the 1930s. And his doctrine was, we were lucky in the 19th century. Uh, people were saving very heavily. That would have operated to reduce the rate of profit. But thank God, along came the railroads and before that, canal building. So technology was giving us sufficient uses to absorb this growing supply of capital goods accumulated by saving. Well, now what this means is, take away the railroads and the canals and all the rest, and somehow, out of a sailboat economy, people could have saved all that capital to build the railroads and the steel mills and everything. It's all sitting there, and now, thank God, the railroads come along, and we have what, where to put it. Well, that is sheer nonsense. A true description of events would be, in the 1830s, in a horse-drawn, ox-cart economy, there was sufficient saving going on so that we could construct the first few primitive railroads. But once we got those first few primitive railroads and co comparable uh, primitive steel mills, what was the effect on our subsequent ability to construct railroads and steel mills? It was greater, and greater in proportion because of further technological developments. With the uh, first railroads and steel mills, we now had the ability uh, to construct bigger, better railroads and steel mills, and on and on. Technological progress is a prime source, not 
We don't need it as the use for capital goods. We've got plenty of uses without technological progress. Our problem would be we wouldn't have the capital goods. So you can see this in a different light. And then there are other factors. Anything that increases production in general will increase the supply of capital goods. Any factor that operates to uh, raise production generally operates to increase the supply of capital goods. What would be some factors that raise production generally? Well, how about free international trade? Greater division of labor. How about economic freedom in general? Anything, this, I, I've made this point before, anything which improves the general efficiency of the economy will serve to promote capital accumulation. Now let's look at another factor which is of uh, special relevance right now here in Southern California. We have immigrants coming in. The usual view is that the immigrants make capital scarce relative to labor. It's not perceived that there might be any connection between a larger supply of labor and a larger supply of capital goods. Well, suppose we have a certain amount of capital goods. Now we have more labor. What's going to be the effect on production of using more labor even with the same supply of capital goods? Production will be greater, right? Including the capital goods. Now, the implication is if we had a one-shot increase in immigration, pretty soon the supply of capital goods would be restored. All right, you can raise the question, uh, what if we have a continuing flow? So uh, is it possible that the immigrants will outweigh the gain in capital goods from the uh, past immigrants? Well, let's look wider, and I'll, this will relate back to a point I made in the first TJS. Imagine we have uh, millions of people growing up in the cultural environment of Mexico and similar places where they uh, have no uh, possibility of developing their talents and they spend their lives as primitive farmers and so on. Now, if we assume that genetically these people are essentially the same as we are and there's the same kind of basic distribution of talent, what should we expect if these people or their descendants can grow up in a society in which the development of individual talent is possible. What should we expect will happen to the absolute number of scientific and technological geniuses, business innovators, and so forth? There'll be more. What should be the effect of that on our general productive efficiency, including our ability to accumulate capital goods? There'll be greater. What, what is the implication for the long-run effect of free immigration on capital accumulation. It should accelerate the process. All right, there's a quotation that I would like to find. Uh, bear with me again a moment. I think I've got it located. And this is from Ricardo. What I've been telling you about uh, the sources of capital accumulation, uh, the real relationship between saving and capital accumulation and other factors was, I think, in essence, perceived by Ricardo. Ricardo has to be understood as always reasoning in a context that is tantamount to assuming the quantity of money fixed. If you read him on that assumption, I think he becomes very understandable. All right, he says, uh, by constantly increasing the facility of production, we constantly diminish the value of some of the commodities before produced. Though by the same means, we not only add to the national riches, but also to the power of future production. From what has been said, it will be seen that the wealth of a country may be increased in two ways. 
It may be increased by employing a greater portion of revenue in the maintenance of productive labor, which will not only add to the quantity but to the value of the mass of commodities. Or it may be increased without employing any additional quantity of labor by making the same quantity more productive, which will add to the abundance but not to the value of commodities. In the first case, a country would not only become rich, but the value of its riches would increase. It would become rich by parsimony, saving, by diminishing its expenditure on obje objects of luxury and enjoyment and employing those savings in reproduction. He's talking now in the context of an economy with a constant quantity of money. In the second case, there will not necessarily be either any diminished expenditure on luxuries and enjoyments or any increased quantity of productive labor employed, but with the same labor, more would be produced. Wealth would increase, but not value. Of these two modes of increasing wealth, the last must be preferred, since it produces the same effect without the privation and diminution of enjoyments, which can never fail to accompany the first mode. Capital is that part of the wealth of a country which is employed with a view to future production and may be increased in the same manner as wealth. An additional capital will be equally efficacious in the production of future wealth, whether, we, whether it be obtained from improvements in skill and machinery or from using more revenue reproductively. For wealth always depends on the quantity of commodities produced without any regard to the facility with which the instruments employed in production may have been procured. Well, that is uh, naming the essential fact that's identifying how capital accumulation actually occurs in the context of a, an economy with a constant quantity of money. It doesn't occur by virtue of the money value of the savings growing. It occurs by virtue simply of the supply, the ability to produce increasing. The effect of more saving in that context is to accelerate progress. It's not necessary to maintain the progress. All right. Well. I hope I've uh, given you some idea of uh, a process of reduction and integration of uh, seeing something and then uh, coming up with where it leads. Uh, you can start, uh, you, you have to keep in mind truths that you can directly observe, let them raise whatever questions they raise and then see how the rest of what you know uh, will fit with what you're observing. And this is what we're doing all the time. Uh, you might have a wife who sees a lipstick stain on her husband's shirt, and you wonder what is the significance, and further investigation can lead to all kinds of implications. <laughs> so that's integration, and here we just started with an accounting concept of profit and uh, have taken it uh, down the road a piece. Uh, I know not enough to be digested, but uh, I wanted you to know what I'm doing and give you some idea. Uh, hopefully, within a couple of years, uh, this will be available in print. Let me say, uh, in closing now, not uh, any longer on economics. Uh, you know, years passed uh, before uh, cigarette advertising was banned. There was a popular commercial, uh, I'd walk a mile for a camel. Well, uh, you people have driven and flown thousands of miles uh, for lectures on objectivism and capitalism. I think that says uh, a great deal about objectivism and capitalism and also about all of you. I hope that we've made it worthwhile for your coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm walking away too soon. I forgot all about the questions. I thought I could go home now. 
and I've unwired myself. Can I be heard? Okay. Uh, yes. I can't can, can, can quite see you. I. Yeah. Is two years from now a sure thing? Well, it depends what kind of uh, editorial interference I encounter. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant uh, about the book. Uh, <laughs> Parts A and B. Parts A and B. Okay. Yes, uh, as far as uh, we are determined, uh, we will have another TJS in two years, uh, subject to uh, you know, having a, a good program with the right speakers being willing to uh, give an appropriate number of lectures. But that is our plan, to have a fourth conference. Yes, sir. Considering the Paul Samuels, do you consider writing a textbook? Considering what about Paul Samuelson? Well, his influence is because of Oh, considering the influence of Paul Samuelson, would I consider writing a textbook? I am writing a book. Uh, which will be usable as a textbook, but not marketed as a textbook, because I don't think uh, I would have very many people buying it for that purpose. So it'll be marketed in the way the government against the economy was marketed, and hopefully have use as a textbook. And uh, a goal of mine, when I complete the book that I'm writing, uh, I would like to then present a full-length course using my book, Human Action and Samuelson. And uh, Samuelson uh, as representing everything that's wrong with the subject. <laughs> Mr. Blair. Now, with your indulgence, if I may, I'd like to ask a question purely for the fun of it. Yeah. At uh, one of the faculty panels at the 1983 conference, you recall the time before Harry Binswanger had earned his PhD, and you recall telling him that anyone without a PhD Pump. And then we went on to recall how the publishing of your book, Dr. Vince Wanger having uh, by that time earned his doctorate, you said that any PhD without a book is a pump. <laughs> now, with the appearance of the Ayn Rand lexicon, what is he going to say? Well, I never can really considered Dr. Ben Swinger a punk. I certainly, I certainly do not do so now. That was just a device to spur him to go and uh, finish his work. Yes, Mrs. Hurwitz, Dr. Hurwitz. All right, the question is, is it a real problem that, if it, uh, that a country which has wealth, uh, like the United States in the early years, uh, but uh, no cash, it has wealth in the form, you mean, of natural resources, uh, but it lacks the cash. The cash, creation of cash is not wealth. Uh, what's required to develop natural resources is wealth, but that would mean the actual capital goods. Uh, or the ability to construct canals, railroads, uh, mining equipment, smelters, and so forth, that would be the wealth that is necessary. Merely creating money uh, does not create wealth. It operates to transfer wealth, first of all, into the pockets of those uh, who get to spend it first. And it takes it from other people who then merely have to pay higher prices and whose uh, money doesn't go as far. Now also, let me point out, uh, it's actually a mistake, too, to think that natural resources by themselves make a country rich. You know, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I uh, spent about a week in Argentina, where I was invited to give some lectures. And the, we constantly met people there uh, who were always saying, this is such a rich country, Argentina. Uh, it's a rich country with a poor people. And they were assuming that their natural resources automatically made them rich. Now, that's actually a collectivistic view. Natural resources in a country may make the owners of the resources rich. Uh, they have no more relevance to making the immediate inhabitants rich 
than natural resources anywhere else. And I would think that uh, in a country that has a lot of natural resources, they might actually get richer faster if the cities became separate countries and no longer regarded the natural resources as their wealth. Uh, the city of Buenos Aires would be much richer. It, it doesn't depend on uh, the, the uh, pompous, uh, th that is not the wealth of Buenos Aires. If the people of Buenos Aires can buy goods from all over the world and develop their own industry, well, the pompous does not have to belong to the same entity as Buenos Aires. It doesn't make them richer. Uh, what makes you richer is uh, saving and accumulating capital goods, uh, constructing a larger and larger supply of capital goods. Japan has no natural resources to speak of. It's just got the industry. You can go and buy the natural resources from any area that has them. All right, for the United States to develop its railroads, it had to borrow. But what built the railroads is not the money when the United States, when individuals in the United States borrowed. Let's say they were borrowing from companies and individuals in Britain. But what made possible the actual building of the railroads was that the money borrowed then made possible the importation of machinery and equipment and so forth from Britain. That's what actually built them. And uh, unfortunately, the importation of the actual wealth is considered as an unfavorable development. Uh, to apply this to the balance of payments, uh, we're generally considered as losing because we uh, import more than we export. Well, the United States in its early years was built up to the extent that it was able to import all kinds of machines and tools and so forth from Great Britain and other European countries and not immediately have to make exports for them. That's the source of the gain, not the giving of the cash. You see, money is not wealth. Gold is wealth to an extent, to the extent that you can physically do something with the gold, that you can fill teeth, put it on pen points and so forth. To that extent, it's wealth. But in its pure money quality, uh, it is not wealth. And by creating money, we don't create wealth. Yes, Mr. Crawford. Do you advocate a bimetallic standard? Do I advocate a bimetallic standard? Uh, by that you mean gold and silver with a fixed exchange rate. I don't advocate a bimetallic standard. Uh, what I think uh, would be the monetary system of a free market would be gold and silver existing as parallel monies without any fixed exchange rate. There would be two independent monies, gold and silver. Bimetallism bi means you attempt to peg the rate. With a parallel standard, they could fluctuate as uh, dollars fluctuate against marks. Now, the reason I think in a free market that there would be a monetary role of silver is because I believe that in a free market, you would have a 100% gold reserve or something very close to it. And that implies an enormously high value of gold. Even right now, if you stop to think, an ounce of gold is uh, practically $500. Now, as Professor Zenholtz pointed out, you want a monetary system in which the, wh what people think of as money, perceptually, is gold or silver coin. But if gold were only worth $500 an ounce, let alone two or 3,000, which is what it would likely be worth, what is the smallest practical size gold coin we could have? One twentieth, a one twentieth of an ounce gold coin is something pretty small, smaller than a dime. It's probably too small. It's like a two peso Mexican coin. Well, 20 into 500, that's already $25. If $25 is too large for the smallest uh, circulating monetary unit. And that is why, historically, when gold really was used to a great degree as money, something else had to circulate alongside of it, namely silver. Uh, for the, and, and the silver coins would have 
uh, lesser value. And even that would be significant if we had gold at $3,000 an ounce. An ounce of silver at the old 15 to 1 ratio would be $200. And a 20th of an ounce of silver, well, that would be $10. And now that, that's uh, on the order of a dime. Now that might give you a clue if you've ever seen old restaurant menus. Uh, this uh, building has, was a stagecoach office in 1840, and at that time a steak cost a dime. Well, translate that into a tenth of an ounce of silver into this kind of value, and uh, you begin to see the nature of what we're talking about. Yeah, Mr. Ralston. Can you share uh, Professor Stenholz's projection for the, the near term that the debt crisis will, will probably lead to more control and particularly in light of the tremendous influx of foreign funds in the United States now that with that model product today? Or do I share Professor Zenholtz's views about where we will uh, end up? I'm just looking at the time. I should be, if I were there, I'd be telling myself this is the last question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I incline uh, more than he does uh, to the government inflating. I, que I tried to question him about his idea that they'll just cut the interest on the debt. Uh, what I think is likely, what, uh, and especially after listening to him, uh, it would seem likely that we could go back into uh, price controls. So I don't think the government can simply say, we're only going to pay 4%. That's equivalent to saying we're paying 50 cents on the dollar. And I don't know of any government in history which has had the power to create money and hasn't created whatever money is required to pay the dollars it owes. If they were going to arbitrarily cut the interest rate, they wouldn't find any private buyers of the bonds. The Federal Reserve would have to create them. Now, I think it's, po uh, it's very possible that they will go back to more regimentation. You see, their choice is every few years to have a major recession like we had in 1982. If they do that, well, well then we're back to the 19th century system, boom, bust. They create money for a while. Then they really get scared. They want to stop it. We go through a depression. If they do that, then inflation will not be a major problem. But that's what's required to stop inflation from being a major problem under our monetary system. So I think it'll be more likely that they go back to the old ways, and when prices start rising and there are the complaints about inflation, uh, the regimentation will occur in the form of controls. Uh, I I'll take this very last question, and then that's it. <laughs> Gat. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the problem of the trade deficit. It seems to be something that's made a big deal of. Would you say is it a real problem? I would say it's not a real problem, uh, but the, what, the trade deficit. But to give you an, a, an adequate answer, it would take about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll be glad to do that uh, sometime today or uh, on the way to lunch. <laughs> But I think I'll have to excuse myself now. Thank you.